The federal government has announced the date for the resumption of international flights from the Lagos and Abuja airports. That's August the 29th. Flight operations on the international route from Nigeria had been suspended by the government in March as part of measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Here's the report. The Minister of Aviation says the process for the resumption of international flights will be similar to that of domestic flights with the Muritala Mohammed International Airport in Lagos and the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja resuming operations first. We are very glad today to announce that um, international flights will resume from the 29th of August. 2020. It will start just like we did with the domestic. It will start with Lagos and Abuja. The protocols, procedures and processes will be announced in due course. However, what we have become used to, physical distancing, wearing of masks, washing of hands, temperature taking, etc., etc., will continue. So all protocols exist. They will continue alongside the opening of these airports. In the beginning, there will be four flights into Lagos and four flights into Abuja daily. We'll give further details on that in due course. With this announcement, the evacuation of Nigerians stranded abroad due to the coronavirus pandemic will be stopped from the 22nd of August to enable airports to fully prepare for reopening. A number of countries have signified intention to repatriate Nigerians convicted and pardon and parole in those countries. They include the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and the United States of America. Coming in the midst of our national response to COVID-19, all relevant agencies of government are taking multi-sectoral steps to ensure that the process remains within acceptable international protocols and in line with bilateral agreements. Right, uh, that's the report there on the resumption of international flights in Lagos and Abuja airports. You're taking this? Well, it's great news for a lot of people who were caught in our wares by the coronavirus and lockdown in Nigeria and needed to travel. Uh, they can do so. And those who want to return home and who could not get on those evacuation flights, mm. which we now hear they are ending on August 25th. Mm. Uh, it's also good for the industry because we know the aviation industry was one of the most uh, badly hit in this pandemic. However, uh, while we wait for those protocols and plans that the minister talks about, I'm a bit skeptical. Uh, w what would the plans contain to ensure that we do not, you know, import um, more cases as we even struggle with local transmission? Yes, you would present your test uh, certificate to show that you've taken a COVID-19 test. Uh, but we also know that this disease has an incubation period. So um, are we going to go the way of other countries who are putting mandatory uh, quarantine period, mm. or are we going to do voluntary? And we know, you know, the, the pros and cons of that. We do not even have enough uh, people to, to follow, follow up and follow through uh, contact tracing. So how are we going to do that for, in, for the international flights? Are we going to ban, put, put a ban on some, you know, hotspots, endemic uh, regions for now, to say, you know, stay away from the country for now. Let's see your numbers go down while we struggle as well. What would these plans contain? I wait to see, but I'm a bit skeptical. Mm, very skeptical, Dr. Abati. Well, on March 27, in response to the threat of COVID-19 and the realization that uh, the initial cases were imported into Nigeria, uh, Nigeria, following the example of other countries, shut down its airports and placed a suspension on international flights. On uh, July 8, domestic flights resumed on a gradual basis. And what you have seen is that the observance of the protocols have been very strict with regard to uh, domestic flights. I haven't had too many people complain about that. So the, the government has gone through a test run period, if you like, and I guess it's on the basis of acquired knowledge and practice uh, with the management of flights that they've now decided that international flights uh, should resume. There were speculations about whether this would be in October, but previously the Minister of Aviation 
assured everyone that it will be earlier than that. And that's precisely what has happened with the choice of August 29. Now, Nigeria is not the only country that is already uh, reopening the airports and allowing international flights. In fact, as at this moment, most countries in Africa uh, have reopened since the beginning of August. And this includes uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, and other uh, countries. But the challenge here is, is it an open gateway? Mm. It cannot be so, because other countries, in fact, when they open their airports, they restrict access to their countries. Take Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan allows uh, access to flights from just seven countries. Now, Russia has also resumed international flights, but in the case of Russia, flights are allowed only from three countries, Tanzania, um, the United Kingdom, and Turkey. The, uh, when Kenya resumed uh, international flights on August 3, uh, Kenya provided a list of just a few countries that can come in and out, in and out of Kenya. And it decided that Tanzania, neighboring Tanzania, is not on that list. Now, Tanzania now has announced that uh, Kenya, on the basis of reciprocal action, cannot come into Tanzania with its flights. So Nigeria has to consider all of this and weigh the options and inform us which countries. Uh, the consideration should not just be commercial. It should be safety. Mm. It should be the security of Nigerians. Mm. And they can come up with just a short list of countries, maybe not more than three, maybe not more than four. Now, many Nigerians have said that uh, the reason we are reopening the uh, airports for international flights is because uh, students who school abroad will resume, uh, you know, in September. But I don't think that that should be the priority. And then there are international protocols in place for international flights. I hope that the Minister of Aviation will also insist on that. Okay. And that the uh, Center for Disease Control uh, will also have a role to play uh, in making sure that opening up our airports to international flights uh, does not translate into an escalation okay. in the uh, positivity rate in Nigeria. All right. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Batia. And, uh, Okay, so that's all we've got uh, on... Uh, okay, we've got another story. Barely five months after he celebrated his 70th anniversary, a former chief press secretary to the dead Major General uh, Muhammad Buhari during his military regime as head of state in 1984, Amala Mwada Maida has died. Until his death, Maida was a member of the executive board of International Press Institute, as well as the chairman board of uh, directors of the News Agency of Nigeria. Uh, there are reports that Maida was in his office yesterday and did not show any signs of sickness, but slumped later at night in his house and failed to recover. Born on March 5, 1915, Katsina State, Wada Maida was the chairman of the Board of Directors, People's Media, and the former editor-in-chief and managing director of News Agency of Nigeria. All right, uh, I got rest So that's all on uh, news headlines. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have the trio of Rotus, uh, Michael, and Aaron to give us updates on Africa and global business and COVID-19. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show, right here on the Rise News Channel. Our dependable Roto Sodiri is here to give us Africa business update. Over to you, Rotan Quat. <laughs> good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Adiswa. Good morning, good morning. Good morning good Doctor. Um, so I think you've already mentioned this, though. Uh, Hadi Sirika's tweet um, with regards to flights uh, resuming, um, he you know, posted that uh, yesterday. Uh, August 29th is when things kick off. Now, the implication of this, though, if you remember... Um, we talked, yeah, there's the tweet right there, happy to announce the resumption of international flights on August 29th, as usual, Lagos and Abuja, uh, which are two out of three of the only profitable airports that we have in the country, will be kicking things off. As he said, uh, the other third one, of course, in reverse protocols and procedures will be announced in due course. Thank you for your patience. Um, if you go back to a conversation we had about NAMA, right, um, we talked about the financial struggles that they were facing. But we can put up that summary again. Um, remember the wage bill? This was a this day story in our sister publication where they talked to the head of NAMA with regards to the issues that we were facing with regards to them not getting enough revenues to pay staff. One of the key things here was that they, re they um, uh, depend on international flights. So they especially, uh, the Nigerian Airspace Management Agency, 
is going to be very much looking forward to international fights resuming so they can start to collect the fees that they do that can uh, allow them to survive. But of course, we still have to discuss the size of the wage bill and other things. But they in particular will be happy that, this, uh, that international fights uh, are resuming. Uh, another byproduct of this is the central bank. Um, also in a uh, sister publication, this day has spoke to Mr. Isaac Okorafor, the CBN uh, Director of Corporate Communications. He says here, customers of BDCs are largely travelers. When the government suspended international fights, the BDCs requested that we grant them holidays. I think they showed a letter to that effect. So once the government announces the resumption of international flights, we're going to resume Forex sales to BDC. So as of the 29th, when that continues. Now, you know, some can argue that that's not the only uh, source of demand for foreign exchanges, not just um, with, uh, with travelers. But at the end of the day, nobody wants to argue here. We just want the foreign exchange liquidity to come back. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to hear that the CBN is going to be at least resuming sales to BDCs, which will at least help to you know, re reduce a bit of the demand that we're seeing with regards to the um, foreign exchange uh, backlog. Uh, another bit of news that came out yesterday, of course, was uh, inflation. We, we, uh, Nigeria's inflation is out for July. We've talked about inflation for a number of other sub-Saharan African nations, but we are at 12.82%. Um, which is up from 12.56, uh, so we continue to see a climb. Um, food inflation, that's one of the main drivers. 15.48% in July was 15.1% uh, in, in, in June. Rice, a uh, number of cereals and so on are, are part of the items that are pushing up food inflation. Also, the border closures, the su supply chain disruptions due to COVID-19. Core inflation that strips out volatile food items, medical services and other items, that was at 10 point. That actually slowed a bit. Uh, from, uh, well, essentially, you can argue it's also flat, core inflation. Urban inflation, that was up 13.4% from 13.1% in June. Rural inflation, 122 up from 11.9%. If you look at the, the, the charts of, uh, of inflation and the, the trajectory, it continues to rise. Remember, a doctor yesterday talked about stagflation. What's the definition of stagflation? Uh, rising inflation, rising unemployment. All we have left is, uh, is GDP, which hopefully we should get in the next uh, two or three weeks or so from the, um, from the Bureau of Statistics with regards to where we're seeing. So what, when we see that, I mean, it's pretty much, I guess, already confirmed that we've been in a period of stagflation for a while. But these numbers uh, are going to essentially validate what we're expecting to see. Um, finally, in South Africa, Tiger Brands is selling their um, meats uh, division. They are selling it to two companies in South Africa. This was as a result of a listerosis uh, outbreak. It's a germ that causes, uh, that attacks people with a weak immune system. It's a pretty bad infection. It led to about uh, the death of 200 South Africans, I believe, in 2018. And the business was shut down. So they're selling it for about their, their meat processing division. They're selling it to two different South African companies. One of them is in Piggery Services. And they're selling it for about 428 million rand, which I think amounts to about uh, 24, 25 million dollars. Tiger Brands is also facing a lawsuit, a clash action lawsuit in South Africa due to the uh, listerosis outbreak that killed a number of people. But they've also mentioned that while they're still facing that lawsuit, no jobs will be affected with regards to their subdivision that they are selling to these um, two particular companies. And that's, that's our update uh, coming from Africa. Well, Rotus, uh, let's focus a little bit more on the inflation figures. Now, quite worrisome. Uh, and 0.26 uptick uh, in aggregate inflation may look uh, like a very small number, but in terms of the implications, uh, it's really very worrisome. But what I would like to pose to you is what kind of policy tools uh, should the government on the fiscal side and on the monetary side apply to see how the impact of this uh, may be mitigated? Because what we have seen uh, with all the uh, various indicators is that it could even get worse. And government has to do something uh, policy-wise, security-wise, uh, and take certain key decisions with regard to economic sustainability. And then the second thing, you talked about the uh, Burudu Shonje operators, uh, you know, now having access uh, again to Forex once international flights uh, resume. You recall that they were the ones who even said they wanted to go on holiday. <laughs> now, that sale, that resumption of activity, uh, how helpful will it be? in terms of effect on the foreign exchange regime. 
All right, so for, with regards to inflation, we talked about Cong the Democratic Republic of Congo was yesterday or the day before. They hiked infl inflation rose in Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo to 14%. They hiked their benchmark rate from 7.5 to 18.5 to combat inflation. So on the monetary side, you want to check inflation by raising rates. Although the flip side of that is if you raise rates, you constrict demand by making um, you know, fun money, accessible money, more expensive. But on the monetary side, what you have to do to check inflation is to raise rates. If you look on the savings and investment side, we're not getting much returns in, with that respect. So raising rates is what you have to do. On the fiscal side, I mean, if you, look at, if you look at what's been going on, the palliatives, to some extent, have assisted businesses and so on. Inflation attacks your purchasing power. So you're not, the items that you purchase, your disposable income is squeezed because things are getting more expensive. So you've got to put more money in people's pockets in order for them to be able to combat rising inflation. So the, you know, on the fiscal side of things, the measures that have been put forward by the government, they are helpful, but they have to be expanded. Um, the BDCs, they are a small portion of uh, FX demand, but they are still um, useful. I mean, Lamido Sanusi has, a, we talked about them recently with regards to them being able to unify the, well, at least be a, a guide towards unifying the, the FX rates between the parallel market and the NAFX. NAFX is at 386, 387 right now. Parallel market is at 470. So if you include, include more demand, well, more supply of dollars to them, that can help in trying to bring trying to, to some extent, rates down. But you still have FPIs that want to repatriate funds out of the country. There's still demand on that side as okay. well. Okay. Hey, there's no time I will have asked you about food inflation. That is at 15% and that keeps rising. But we'll talk about that probably tomorrow. All right. Just have that in mind. Moving on to the business update. Michael Wilson joins us from London. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Uh, I'll Good take morning. you to China first. And, uh, it, it's, it, I have to pre-warn you, it's been a fairly quiet uh, 24 hours. But um, China... Uh, eked out a few little gains, uh, healthcare and consumer stocks doing quite well there. By contrast, Japan shares dropped from a near six-month peak, carrying on from what I was talking about yesterday, political uncertainties really um, around the world, sapping <clears throat> excuse me, investors' risk appetite. The big undercurrent, of course, is that the United States is still uh, say it will impose further restrictions on Huawei, uh, and the Trump administration's view, of course, is that uh, Huawei is essentially an arm of China's ruling Communist Party, so nothing's changed there. So therefore, all in all, probably a fairly quiet start for uh, European indices. Yesterday, um, equity markets in both Europe and the United States gained a bit of ground despite a relatively negative backdrop. The COVID-19 fears are continuing. Nations that opened their economies um, a few weeks ago are now worrying about their paying the price in terms of the infection rate and also tighter restrictions as well. So we're in that kind of limbo at the moment. Nobody has really any idea of where this is all going. At the weekend, as you know, the US and China were supposed to discuss their trade deal, but it didn't actually happen. Uh, as you know, we talked about this last week, President Trump signed an executive order that was uh, getting TikTok to sell its US business within 90 days. Um, the US administration said this was about national security. Uh, it's a subsidy of China's bite dance. Uh, and that's a factor between the poor relationship. And Oracle turns out today to be one of the, uh, the latest in a queue of suitors to buy the uh, American arm uh, or the American based uh, part of TikTok. Uh, NASDAQ, another record. S&P 500 gained 0.3. Dow Jones closed a little lower, and, and that really uh, is, um, again, what's going on, really. People are buying anything as far as tech stocks are concerned. And they're certainly not buying more general stocks as represented by the Dow Jones and, more importantly, the S&P 500. Uh, I was reading yesterday that uh, Mike Meadows, who's the White House Chief of Staff, has not spoken to Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. So, again, I think that um, idea of... Uh, uh, the coronavirus package being brokered soon has gone a long, long way away. And the argument is all, as you know now, about the U.S. postal system. And there's a fear that uh, the Trump administration wants to keep the service operating at a relatively low pace uh, because it was said it won't be uh, fit to handle. And therefore, there'll be more debate about what the true outcome of the election actually is. <clears throat> so um, we were talking, Doctor, yesterday about... Uh, 
hopes of a V-shaped recovery, and that's gone further and further away. New York Fed manufacturing index is sort of confirming that. Um, I won't go into the detail of it. You can read about it if you wish to, but I'm just saying that what's probably happened in terms of putting the world to rights is pent-up demand, uh, which caused people to go out and shop, and maybe that's not happening anymore. So just briefly onto onto commodities and um, the, the weakness in the US dollar has given a boost to gold, silver and platinum and so on. Uh, and, and also the rally in uh, industrial metals has really meant that uh, uh, particularly like copper and palladium, for example, is that dealers are on a sort of a risk on mode. Um, as far as oil is concerned, OPEC confirmed, now this is interesting, OPEC's confirmed that 97 percent uh, of its OPEC plus rather confirmed that 97 percent of its members and the, the so the plus members have actually uh, complied with the uh, risk the, the the production cuts that were that were proposed and also um, Chinese firms have apparently uh, booked tankers to transport 20 millions of US 20 million barrels of US oil covering August and September so I think that's generally going to keep the oil market quite healthy uh, if you like high price high-ish prices in the oil market for quite some time and I, I, I again I could be wrong but my sources are saying to me that we're due for a, a rise in the oil price significant one uh, in the fourth quarter of the year but of course we'll see yeah. that's okay. the global view Michael two questions one uh, President Trump has been blowing uh, hot and cold uh, he says he's offering incentives to American companies to pull out of uh, uh, China, and that he hopes within the next three years through that to create about 10 million jobs within the U.S. And that companies that insist on doing business in China and refuse to uh, pull out or who insist on outsourcing jobs to China uh, would be uh, sanctioned. Now, is a divorce, a U.S. divorce with uh, China, is it really uh, possible? Uh, is it something that would happen? Or what we're just seeing is... Uh, President Trump uh, using the opportunity of election year to just uh, make statements. And then in the UK, the Bank of England uh, last month was telling us that there was hope of a V-shaped uh, recovery by the second quarter of 2021. But now the same Bank of England is not so uh, um, optimistic about the pace of uh, recovery. And the Monetary Policy Committee at its last meeting uh, still kept interest rates at uh, 1 percent and also uh, put a cap on their quantitative easing. Is, is that uh, helpful in the light of the serious economic challenges that the uh, UK is facing? I, I think, the, I think let's, let's do the Bank of England first. I think that uh, the Bank of England will, um, it, 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 it operates, I, I don't know how your central bank operates, but um, the Bank of England operates through a series of agents, as they call them, throughout the UK. And these people are supposed to keep an eye on, on the pulse of what's happening in the economy. So the Monetary Policy Committee uh, is, a, is a sort of central point of, of those reports. And that's why they, they, they take the, the, the policies that they do. Not to say that they don't have their own mind about things. They don't have economists on it. Yes, of course, they do. But I think you find things are changing. I think this, this is absolutely impossible to predict right now. I think the, the, the steadying voice of the Bank of England is to say we learned a lot of lessons, as did the banking uh, sector during the financial crisis of 2008. And those lessons are being brought forward now. The bottom line, I think, Doctor, is that actually money is quite cheap at the moment. Oh. And so you can more or less you can you, you can more or less say 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 what you like as far as the united states and china is concerned yes i think there's an enormous amount of political capital being shifted around at the moment uh, again I, I i find it very odd that this stimulus package which and they, they say they are trillions of dollars apart still in terms of what they want to do i do find it odd that you actually uh, that these politicians are planning to go into an election uh, without anything being sold because th whatever flack and noise there will be about the election i think that people would rather like a job to go to thank you very much indeed <laughs> and uh, once, that, uh, one, 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 once all that's sorted out then i think we can you know that the, 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 there is a way forward if i were a politician in the united states right now 
I'd be worried about what my voters, what my local voters would be thinking, because they'd be saying, what, what have you been doing in this debate? What, how is it now? Is, 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 it, is it because the markets are doing quite well? Is it because, you know, you've, you've lost concentration? You don't speak to Nancy Pelosi? What's all that about? It's quite bizarre, isn't it? It's a very, very odd way of going about things. And I, I think that the electorate in the United States will... Uh, let's, let's wait until Labour Day is over and all the rest of it. And then, then I think that they were going to make some pretty serious decisions about who they'd like in the White House. And it's not necessarily Joe Biden. <laughs> Talk about the way to put off the voters. But still talking um, U.S.-China trade relations, Michael, um, national security seems a convenient excuse. But do you think that the Trump administration is using uh, national security to frustrate Chinese businesses? Uh, I think... <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I think what, what's happening in, in the United States, as far as China's concerned, is this is a very good thing to take into an election, to say that we're going to build our own semiconductors and all the rest of it, and we're going to own that particular part of the <coughs> economy that Huawei finds itself in, not just, of course, in the United States, but also in the UK and, and around the world as well. So it's become a a very convenient whipping boy for politicians to be able to say, well, we're going to... Because what, what, Because the next thing is to say, well, where will you make them? Well, I don't know. They'll, be, they'll make them in weak constituencies, in weak districts, and they will promise thousands of jobs. I mean, that's what, as a politician, that's what I'd be doing, and I think that's what's happening in the United States. So, yes, it is frustrating, Huawei, and I would go back to the point about China. They do not think in the same... And, and this, this is not a racist label at all... This is the way that they think about eras. They do not think about political ups and downs. They think about long eras. And the present era yeah. is, I don't know when it's going to expire, but that's yeah. the truth of it. I, I mean, playing I, a very I, long I mean I, can, I can well tell you when it's going to expire. There's a book called The Hundred Year Plan about China. So it's, it's going to expire about the next hundred years. But thank you so much for that. And time. that's Ma why Michael Ma is not Michael. a politician. <laughs> Michael Wilson, thank you so much. Uh, for update on COVID-19 pandemic, Aaron Akerja lies here with us. Aaron, great to talk to you. Yeah, good morning to you, Rufai. Good Hello. morning, Doctor. Good morning. Uh, more importantly, good morning to you, Adesua. Why importantly? Yeah. Thank you very much <laughs> and good morning, Aaron. OK, let's get straight into the matter today and looking at how things are actually playing out in terms of COVID-19. Now, the numbers, we still have been talking about the numbers. Um, 21,885,268 are the number of confirmed cases globally. And at the moment, we still have well over 700,000, getting closer to 800,000 global deaths with the United States, Brazil and Mexico, and India in that particular order still leading in the number of deaths and mortality we've seen for COVID-19. But yesterday, something actually came up and talking about COVID-19, there were, there were, there've been a back and forth between, uh, yesterday, this morning, there's been a back and forth between the US President and the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, and the, and the US President. Now, they've been talking about COVID-19 in their country. Donald Trump referenced what is happening in New Zealand. And I think the only thing, the only difference was that he overemphasized what is happening in New Zealand. We've seen an upsurge of cases in New Zealand recently more because we knew that they went 102 days without an infection. That was no doubt settled, but they've seen an upsurge of cases. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, we've seen 19 cases, of which 17 came from the Auckland region. And you look at that right now, that you just puts them side by side. There is no comparison in terms of infection rate and in terms of mortality rate and in terms of recovery when it comes to COVID-19. So certainly, Donald Trump might have overstretched it, but New Zealand did not take it lying down. You can actually see the, the differences there in the figures. You can see how the U.S. have actually spiked. They, they plateaued at some point. They actually had they tried to flatten the curve, but things have not really been the same for them. We've seen states that usually were looking good. As soon as they opened up from the lockdown, they began to see a major upsurge in cases, while New Zealand have actually... They literally just killed the curve, not just even flattened the curve. They killed the curve completely at some point, 102 days, and we are now beginning to see a resurgence of cases. And that's something synonymous with COVID-19. As soon as you cap it down, and until as you try to lock down the community and movement, COVID-19 literally dissipates astronomically. But as soon as you decide to lift those lockdowns, lift off the shackles, then you begin to see spread. As, soon, as long as people are moving, 
COVID-19 will keep spreading. And that is a fact at the moment. Since we are talking about facts, let's actually look at some sciences now. There have been a lot of sciences and there's been a lot of talk about COVID-19 and how things are actually playing out. Looking at the new research that is actually coming. Before we come into what is happening in Novava, the new research that is actually coming in right now has actually making some major points about COVID-19. Remember, this is a novel virus, and more importantly, we're getting to know this. We're learning on our feet and learning on the go in terms of COVID-19. And there are some facts that have actually come in, and one of them, one of the major ones, is that mild COVID-19 um, patients have induced prolonged immune response. We've seen this thing happen with COVID-19 patients. We've been, there have been talks about some, if you have COVID-19, um, certainly you will be able to see some Maybe new, you will maybe, maybe see some infections uh, actually go up. But right now, there are talks that if you've had COVID-19 and you've actually been able to beat it, you can actually stay more than a month or even longer. If they can help us with the graph there of the sciences, or even longer without, uh, without even contracting it. And if you do even contract it, you might not be able to spread it in terms of COVID-19 there. Yeah. Thank you very much, of course. And COVID-19 survivors, which is very key, they say most of them are prone to psychiatric disorders or prone to mental illnesses. So we've seen COVID-19, or rather the test that was being done on several people noticed that there was a pattern that some people do have psychiatric disorders after experiencing COVID-19, severe or mild. So for those that who have actually found themselves in this particular situation, they should seek medical help because it's very, very common or it's becoming, it's becoming a trend with COVID-19. Another one actually says that the early use of antibody-rich um, adolescent plasma has actually helped the mortality rate heavily, reducing it drastically. So we were talking about antibodies and the plasmas in the fight against COVID-19, and it is still one of the best ways to combat those who are suffering from severe COVID-19 symptoms antibody-rich plasma, one of the ways to go about it. And another thing that has been proven by science right now is that viral load is not linked to smell or taste recovery. So it doesn't matter if you have mild or severe symptoms. It doesn't have anything to do with your taste or your smell. So these are some of the things we're seeing. Now, moving on to South Africa, because we are hearing that at the moment that great things are happening in South Africa, not only at the U.S., uh, not only are the U.S. giving PPEs to the South African government, also let's tell you that Novavax are also, they've actually come out and said that they will be starting the first phase of clinical trial in South Africa. And that's Glenn Gregory talking about the, the president of R&D for Novavax, uh, saying that the uh, vaccine, talking about the MVS COV-2373, will be going into phase two of the clinical trial. So let's see what actually becomes of that. We know that a lot of work has been done with the Vitz University in South Africa, which is being headed by Dr. Madhi. We saw the, we saw the Oxford University go same, to that same Vitz University. And right now, Novavax are going there also for major clinical trials. We're hoping that they will be successful. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are supporting Novavax with $15 million in grants for this particular trial. So we're hoping good things actually come out from this because ultimately it is the world that will be better off for it. All right. I, I'm really excited about the stories you brought forward today. But I want to talk about Lagos. I, mean, I read a report recently that says the cases are pretty much going down. Mm. Uh, if you look at it, uh, do you have any uh, thing to buttress that? I also want to talk about the vaccine race. Where yeah. are we on this? Yeah. Phase three going on with the Russian vaccine. How far are we going on that? Uh, most importantly, too, we've talk, you, you talked about the fact that uh, research showed that people that have coronavirus before might suffer mental illness. We've seen stories like that. Also, neurological disorders and other things like this are things part of it. Is there another threshold to, the, uh, to how long you can carry that antibody. Some people are saying you can't go beyond three months. Some people are saying you can't go beyond months. Some people are saying you can go for life. Have they done enough research? Here are those three questions. <laughs> All right, starting from the last question, certainly we are not sure yet, but some say that antibodies do dissipate in the body after, after three months. Right now, they are saying that between one month or it could even last as much as six months or even longer. We're not sure of the time frame. But certainly, we found out that those that have actually contracted COVID-19 and have been able to beat it 
Some, most, of, most times actually produce the antibodies that can stretch for a long period of time. But more importantly is the fact that not just them producing these antibodies, the fact that when they do contact COVID-19, again, they will not become spreaders, which is actually very good news there. So you might even have COVID-19 and not even know it, but the fact that you're not a spreader certainly makes it very, very good. So, which is very comforting, I must actually say. Lagos State, we've been seeing things. Testing is one thing. And another thing is, I must say, with, with a lot being put into the mix in terms of COVID-19 and the way Nigeria has actually handled COVID-19, we can't really say for sure. There are no sciences backing why there might be an upsurge of cases or why there might be a reduction of cases in places in Nigeria. I must say, I'm going to be very sincere with you. The vaccine... All right, talking about the vaccine, we are, we are still doing major clinical trials here. We have not heard from the WHO in terms of them screening the Russian vaccine because they would have to give green light it before they begin to um, vaccinate people. So we're not, we've not heard from the WHO concerning the Russian vaccine. That is the farthest we've gone in terms of vaccine. We're still hoping that in September, Novavax might be coming out with something. We're still hoping that the Oxford University alongside AstraZeneca might be coming up with their own vaccine in September leading up to October. At the moment, that is where we stand right now. Well, uh, Aaron, thank you very much. Just to point out that uh, the uh, attempt to compare the U.S. with New Zealand <laughs> that uh, President Trump attempted, uh, tried, uh, that was quite laughable because the major issue here, it's about leadership. And we've seen Jacinta Ardern uh, with her one million team uh, showing great determination and leadership in combating uh, COVID-19, whereas the reverse <laughs> is what we have seen uh, yes. with uh, President Trump, who even quarrels with his own scientists over, over science and research. Thank you very much. Yeah. We'll see you tomorrow. Morning. Always a pleasure.